So we're going to switch gears to pediatrics for a couple of minutes. Um, and I realize that obviously part of this was to discuss our new pancreas program. We will not be doing pediatric pancreas transplants, at least in the near future. So for right now, we're doing adult only. And despite the fact that Dr. Grusner said he had done some, pe um, some living donors, we're also not doing living donors. So the, the, the pancreas program is going to be strictly adult deceased donors. So everything that Dr. Bambola is going to discuss is only kidney related. Uh, OK, so I'm going to be focusing on the um, uh, pediatric aspect of uh, kidney transplantation. And um, I'm trying to at least, you know, illustrate, you know, some of the differences, you know, that we have, you know, for pediatric kidney transplant and that of the adults. Um, pediatric kidney transplant, you know, um, is the preferred modality uh, for treating end-stage kidney disease. And the reason is that, you know, the five years of survival probability is almost about 95%. Uh, when you compare it to the, pro the five year survival that you get from uh, either hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis. And uh, unlike in the adult population, when um, we have to get to very low GFR, you know, before we consider kidney transplantation, uh, for pediatric patients, we prepare to, we start preparing them for kidney transplantation, you know, as um, soon as the GFR is getting below 30 cc per minute. Um, because, um, you know, quality of life, as you know, you know is quite important uh, for uh, pediatric you know, uh, patients. So, um, early pediatric kidney transplant is, op is often complicated, you know, by technical and immunological problems, uh, all kinds of logistic issues, uh, you know, which led to the fact that, you know, the grass survival among children used to be much lower than that of the adults. But uh, in the last 25 years, you know, we've had a lot of advancements in uh, patient and graft survival among children, and it's almost equal to that of the adults. Uh, as in the adults, we, the pediatric kidney transplantation you know, is um, limited you know, by shortage of organ donor. Uh, for instance, you know, in 2016, uh, 871 kidney transplants were performed. But by the end of that year, there was about uh, 1,500 on the transplant waiting list. The major differences you know, that you have you know, between the transplant in children and adults, you know, they are driven by you know, these factors. Uh, you have um, immunological factors and processes. You know, they are quite different you know, between that of the children and adults, especially the younger the, ch the, younger the child. Uh, Primary kidney disease also vary, you know, between the two populations. Pattern of immunizations are different. Allocation policies are also uh, tend to favor you know, children more than that of the adults. Uh, surgical techniques, you know, require a lot of expertise when it comes to smaller children. Uh, drug metabolism and pharmacokinetics, you know, vary between the two populations. And there is higher frequency of primary viral infection in children compared to that of the adults. And there is need to optimize the linear growth, longitudinal growth of children, and that of neurocognitive development. So I will spend a few times on each of these um, uh, if, uh, factor. So we do know that you know, the fetal environment you know, demands that um, uh, the fetus has to be uh, tolerant you know, of the maternal antigens. So, but after birth, you know, there is um, a lot of exposure to tremendous amount of um, environmental antigen, you know, that cause for rapid change, you know, in immune responses, such that about absolute counts of T cells and that of the B cells, uh, they begin to slowly evolve uh, with eventual increase in a lot of alloreactivity, a lot of memory cells, you know, being formed, you know, by that of the adults. Uh, also, in adults, you know, we tend to have a thymic atrophy, and we do have this continuous antigen exposure to the, ad to the adult, such that there is, a pool, there is a shift in the T cell pool from naive to that of the memory cells you know, predominantly. There is a lower expression of co stimulatory CD40 ligand. There, is, there are fewer antigen specific uh, precursor cells, and uh, there is higher type 2 helper cells 
you know, compared to that of the type 1 you know, cytokine response. Consequently, you know, because the B cell response depends on activation of uh, helper cells, and we do know that you know, there is a deficit in T helper cells. So you have a situation whereby you tend to have lower anti-HLA antibody you know, for children compared to that of the adults. In highly live, you know, the CDT4 cells preferentially develop into Treg. Uh, if we know anything about Treg, you know, they tend to be tolerogenic. So you do have you know, pediatric immunity uh, much more tolerogenic than that of the adults. So uh, to summarize, you know, we have decreased antigen experience still cells you know, for children. That is predominant immature macrophages. You have decreased HLA and low reactive antibodies. And uh, you have a reduction in antigen presented cells, such as the mature dendritic cells. Uh, so, you know, overall, these immunological advantages for transplants, you know, uh, provide a basis you know, for a better graft outcome in children compared to that of the adults. But we all know because of a lot of confounding variations, uh, this is not exactly the case, such as the fact that you know, children, you know, they tend to be poorly adherent you know, to their medications, so they lose some of these immunological advantages. The causes of end-stage kidney disease in children uh, also vary. Uh, uh, most common primary causes of kidney failure are congenital. So you have uh, renal dysplasia, you could have posterior atrial valve, you know, causing obstructive uropathy, you know, you could have reflux nephropathy as a result of uh, uh, bladder dysfunction. On the other hand, you know, older children, they tend to uh, have acquired glomerular diseases such as FSGS and lupus nephritis. But most common in adults is um, Things like uh, diabetic nephropathy, you know, hypertension, and ADPKD uh, causing end stage kidney disease. So, as you could see here, you know, we have congenital anomalies, you know, uh, constituting you know, 37.3% of the etiology of end stage kidney disease, whereas you know, FSGS is only about 10%. There are also a lot of urologic issues, you know that are quite common, you know, in children undergoing kidney transplants. And this is one of the peculiarities of children compared to that of the adults. You just have to face, pay very close attention to their bladder function. So abnormal bladder function may result from uh, things like a posterior atrial valve. You could have neurogenic and non-neurogenic you know, voiding dysfunction, such as spina bifida. You know, you could have uh, uh, all kinds of obstructive uropathy. Uh, Eurodynamic study is often necessary for the evaluation of small bladder capacity, uh, high storage pressure, and for incomplete you know, bladder emptying, uh, such that you know, pre-transplant intervention may be necessary. Uh, one of the pre-transplant intervention, you know, um, is uh, bladder augmentation, and the bladder augmentation is of often done using. Um, a detubularized patch of ileum, uh, colon, and sometimes stomach. But the problem is that you know, bladder augmentations have a lot of complications, such as metabolic acidosis. You could have uh, perforation in about uh, 1 to 10, 13 percent, with case fatality rate resulting from perforation accounting for almost about 25 percent. You could have risk of malignancy as a result of bladder augmentation. You could have bladder urolithiasis and recurrent UTI. Over a 10-year period, there may be need for re-augmentation that ranges from about you know, 5 to 13 percent. So that's a lot. So in the future, I mean, bladder tissue engineering may produce a more durable material uh, for augmentation. But you know, we're not there yet. You know? So uh, some of the attempts at bladder tissue engineering uh, produce um, actually uh, uh, a poor result at the moment. Because of the concerns you know, for the high rate of complica complications, uh, this has led to the uh, decline in the use of um, augmentation procedure, uh, both in the United States and Europe. Now, the, um, 
the con contradictions that you have for pediatric transplantations you know, has evolved uh, over the years, you know, um, uh, such that um, you know, what used to be contradiction in the past, you know, they are no longer contradiction at the moment. Uh, for instance, we do know that a lot of you know, transplant providers uh, will preclude the use of um, uh, this public pool disease donor and will rather use uh, living related you know, um, uh, they will rather, rather use you no know, living related um, donor you know for patients with neurodevelopmental delay and and the argument at that time at, at least I still remember that when I was in training the argument is such that it is probably not cost beneficial you know to give uh, public source you no know, disease donor to no developmental handicap patients. And you know, such discrimination is no longer tolerated, you know, because we know that it's a double tragedy, you know, for you to be undergoing dialysis and at the same time, you know, for you to have a you know, developmental handicap. So the tendency nowadays is that um, you know, we provide more justice you know, to uh, this group of patients and we do provide them with kidney transplant as, as needed. Also in the past, I used to remember that you know, uh, there are many transplant providers. The moment you tell them you have FSGS, the moment we know the diagnos diagnosis of FSGS, you know, they will not do clean transplant for you. And what was driving that was because you know, there was a high rate of recurrence, okay, almost about you know, 40 to 50 percent recurrence you know, for somebody that has FSGS. And in the past, we are very, we are very limited in the way we treat these patients. But nowadays, we have a lot of patients with uh, FSGS you know, that can survive you know, for a long period of time. If we make the diagnosis on time, okay, so we can reverse you know, this condition you know, so by doing uh, plasmapheresis. Uh, also, uh, children with active infection and those with malignancy, uh, they are not considered you know, candidates you know, for kidney transplants. Uh, a lot of um, transplant centers will wait until you are cancer free for about two years you know, before they consider you for kidney transplant. Uh, adherence is a big deal you know, for children. Uh, you know, if you have evidence you know, that you are not adherent, okay, so that may be a reason for us to make sure that um, we give you adequate training, you know, uh, provide you with adequate education and ensure that, okay, you'll be compliant, you know, uh, as far as um, taking medication after the kidney transplantation. We do know that you know, patients with active SLE, those with antibodies to, to GBM, you know, so that um, they, these are contraindications you know, for uh, transplant. Um, relative, we know that there seems to be recurrence you know, from some diseases such as FSGS, MPGN, SLE, uh, atypical HUS. So these are not contraindications, but then you know, if you have any of these issues, we know that it could result in shorter allograft survival, so we need to consult the families accordingly. Uh, in fact, in a large court you know, uh, by Goral et al., he found that there was 30% recurrence you know, for SLE with grass survival of 87% at one year and 60% at five years. Uh, this is against you know, many studies that seems to indicate that um, you, know, you don't have a lot of recurrence you know, in uh, lupus. Uh, the reason being that many of those studies are retrospective and many times you when know, we do kidney biopsy for patients with kidney transplants, we normally do not include the electron microscopy. But in these studies, electron microscopy was involved, and they were able to find that you know, there is high recurrence rate you know, for SLE. But the good thing is that the survival at five years you know, is not terrible compared to other diseases. Uh, in fact, you know, so in, about, um, yeah, in, in another study you know, by Gabriel et al., uh, recurrent, for recurrent lupus nephritis uh, resulted in graft loss uh, in about 93% of the patient compared to that of 17% in, uh, uh, in the control. 
Uh, the success rate you know, for kidney transplant in infants younger than one year is much less compared to that of the older children. So we try to wait until patients are at least above 10 kg you know, before we give them kidney transplant. So we provide adequate nutrition and dialysis instead you know, before uh, 10 kg. Also, um, immunization is a big deal for children because you know, they require multiple vaccinations in early childhood. And if you wait until after kidney transplantation, many of these vaccinations may not be effective. So we want to make sure that we provide them with adequate immunization. So we measure viral titers. Uh, and anyone that is seronegative, you know, we should, should receive appropriate vaccine at least six weeks you know, before transplantation. Special attention should be paid to live attenuated vaccines such as varicella and MMR. The reason for this is that you know, primary varicella disease you know, can be disseminated and um, may be fatal in um, seronegative you know, pedi pediatric kidney transplant recipients. We should make sure that in the family and household contacts of um, patients receive MMR as well as you know, varicella vaccine. We should routinely administer DTP in children and we should provide booster immunization uh, for uh, tetanus and diphtheria at least every 10 years. We should periodically monitor HBV antibody, you know, after transplant and administer booster if there is low titers, at least you no know, less, uh, low titers of our less than 10 international units, you no know, per CC. We should routinely provide annual influenza vaccine to pediatric kidney transplant recipients and their household contacts. Um, I know this has been mentioned, you know, so I'll just mention talk about it briefly. In 1984, uh, National Organ Transplantation Act you know, charged OPTN to optimize healthcare needs you know, because we know the peculiarity of um, needing to grow and needing to have uh, adequate social development in children. So uh, in the design of the national allocation system. So prior to the year 2005, children less than 17 years uh, they will receive additional allocation priority points on the account of their age. And um, also in consideration for the duration of uh, extended waiting times. But in 2005, uh, UNOS introduced you no know, share, share 35 policy. And share 35 policy prioritized pediatric kidney transplantation to receive organs from donors you know, that are less than 35 years of age. But then it removed the benefit of extended waiting times. Uh, this policy led to uh, unexpected, you no, know, we're not unexpected, you know, um, you know uh, unfortunate, you know, decline in the donation of kidneys, you know, by living donors, because it doesn't take a lot of time, you know, for them to get uh, diseased donors. So mothers and uh, parents, you know, that used to, uh, uh, provide you know, um, living, do living donation, you know, uh, they shy away from that. You know, the, a new kidney allocation system was adopted in December 2014, uh, which was intended you know, to better align the quality of organs with the quality of donors using KDPI as a tool. Although as a result of this, there was no statistically significant disadvantage, uh, but there was a reduction in the uh, pediatric transplant rates. And um, this, there may be need for policy modification in order for us to minimize dialysis exposure time, you know, that can be potentially fatal to pediatric patients. So supporting the policies to promote early access to kidney transplants and avoid dialysis exposure is the fact that, you know, there is um, a lot of benefits, you know, from preemptive transplantation, as can be seen in this study. Among 7,500 pediatric kidney transplant you know, recipients in a USRDS you know, cohort of 2000 to 2012, 22% uh, you know, received preemptive kidney transplantation. Majority of them uh, was um, a living donor. But um, preemptive kidney transplant recipients, you know, they tend to be younger. Uh, they are more likely to be white. Uh, they are more likely to be males. They often have you know, congenital anomaly as the reason for their end-stage kidney disease. 
They tend to have private insurance and they live in wealthier neighborhoods. Now, the dialysis exposure conferred higher risk of graft failure, or at least the hazard ratio of about 1.3, and higher risk of death with hazard ratio of 1.7, you know, in multivariate analysis, you know, according to this study. The, the longer the time the patients, you know, spent on dialysis, the higher the likelihood that there will be graft failure, about 52% higher. And the longer the time, you know, a patient, you know, same, a patient staying for more than 18 months on dialysis, they have close to about 89% higher risk of death, regardless of whether the donor source is a living or deceased donor. And as can be seen here, you know, so as patients who had um, living donor preventive kidney transplantation, uh, they have the best survival advantage, as you can see here. You know, why there is a worse outcome in those who had you know, disease donor non preemptive kidney transplantation. So there are certain um, surgical issues you know, that um, somewhat may be peculiar to uh, pediatric transplantation because you know, the kidney allograft is placed in a different location uh, from that of um, uh, the failed organ. Uh, size and age matching is not required, unlike what you have you know, for lungs, uh, for heart, and for the liver. And in the past, you know, people used to think that you know, if you size match the patient, that you are likely to get a better outcome you know, um, in the graft. But it turned out that um, infant to infant matching was a very bad idea as it was associated with a very high rate of uh, thrombotic graft uh, loss. Uh, so nowadays, adult kidneys are transplanted into small children, but typically those children will have a minimum weight of about 10, 10 kg. Uh, one of the things with the allograft you know, size mismatch is that because you are putting a bigger kidney into uh, smaller children, so there is a relatively high GFR because you have a relatively high GFR, you know, then the creatinine will tend to be low. And you may not know when the creatinine is increasing uh, when there is acute re rejection episode. That way, it may lead to the delay in the diagnosis of acute rejection episode, especially for smaller children. It's also important to pay very close attention, you know, to the fluid balance uh, during and after surgery you know, because of the total body water, you know, for children, you know, um, is a um, bigger proportion of their body weight. Small children also may require native nephrectomies. Uh, this is to eliminate urine volume. There are certain diseases, you know, that you have in children, you know, that may cause nephrogenic DI, you know, such as cystinosis, you know, and uh, if you do not remove the native kidney, you know, so this may be counterproductive you know, because they may have a relatively low total body, uh, total body water, which may compromise, you know, the kidney transplantation. Also, if you have uncontrolled nephrotic syndrome, you know, that may, after kidney transplant, you know, that may result in a, a hypercoagulability and thrombotic graft loss. So it may be necessary to remove uh, that kind of kidney, the kidney with uncontrolled nephrotic syndrome, you know, before you transplant the patient. So for children who are greater than 30 kg, you know, the procedure for kidney transplantation is not necessarily different from that of the adults. So you place the kidney in a left fossa, you know, outside of the peritoneal cavity using a Gibson incision. Uh, but for smaller children, uh, you use a midline incision in order to place the kidney intraperitoneally. There are clinical trials on pediatric uh, immunosuppression, you know, that um, uh, detect what we do uh, at the moment, you know, uh, with regards to uh, induction and maintenance immunosuppression. Uh, such clinical trials, they are often based on uh, multi-institutional compression, you know, because, uh, because as we know, uh, many um, transplant units they rather have a you know, small population, and it's often difficult you know, to do a uh, single trial study. Uh, so high doses of immunosuppression, 
such as the use of sirolimus and tacolimus to compensate for steroid withdrawal, you know, can lead to unacceptable rates of uh, PTLD. And there is a study that came from Alabama, you know, by Benfield. You know, they tried to use sirolimus and tacolimus. These were the days when we used to use high doses of sirolimus, you know, as well as uh, carcinoid inhibitors. Uh, and you know, they were attempting to withdraw this to, uh, they, they withdraw steroid, you know, on the account of this. But um, by the end of one year, uh, that was close to about 10 to 15 percent, you know, rate of uh, PTLD, and they had to stop the study. Uh, another study by McDonald, you know, RA in 2008, the PTLD rate was about 7 percent, and that was five-fold higher rate of PTLD in those who are less than five years compared to those who are greater than 12 years of age. We do know that uh, tacrolimus you know, is more potent you know, than sacrosporin, so you see that many of the uh, maintenance immunosuppression you know, are practically based on tacrolimus nowadays compared to the use of sacrosporin. The acute rejection rate you know, is lower at six months for tacrolimus than sacrosporin. The story of bilatacept, you know, which is a selective T-cell co-stimulation blocker, you know, um, you know, has been tried, you know, uh, in benefit trial, you know, compared, you know, with uh, cyclosporine uh, for kidney transplantation, and it showed that there is a better mean GFR uh, at 60 months. There is also um, a pointer, you know, to the fact that, um, you know, there is a better adherence, you know, in the use of uh, bilatacept. You know, because, you know, you've got to give it, you know, parenterally. And this will be very suitable, especially, you know, for children. You know, like in adolescents, you know, who tend to, uh, will face the problem of non-adherence. But the problem is that um, uh, despite this adherence advantage, uh, a lot of transplant testers are still very cautious using this in children because of the concern for the risk of PTLD. Because we do know that many children, they are HBV negative and they are more likely to have um, <coughs> uh, infection. Yeah. The pediatric transplanters are a little bit ahead of the adults in that regard. This is frequently used. And we have been used it as well for patients with carcinoma inhibitor toxicity that, are, that don't tolerate um, hecrolimus and so forth. The latter step now is given in adults on a monthly basis, one injection. No more program. You still give cell set. But based on the children, we know that the results are actually very good. Mm -hmm. So that's one of these antibodies that I mentioned at the beginning. This yeah. is, again, the co-stimulatory locate. But this will become mainstream, I think so. And, and I mean, the pediatric experience has tremendously helped in that mm -hmm. regard. Um, we also know that some um, pharmacokinetic studies that have been done for carcinoid inhibitors, they use sacrosporin as a prototype. Um, for sirolimus, they show that there is a shorter half-life in younger children. Uh, in many of the younger children, you know, so you may have to use, you know, three times daily dose of sacrosporin or two times daily dose of sirolimus, you know, in order for you to, uh, uh, in order for you to take advantage of the uh, pharmacokinetic difference in pharmacokinetic characteristics uh, between the two populations. We also know that um, the area under the curve you know, for those normalized you know, um, mycophenolic acid is higher in children than that of adults, such that in many steroid-free protocols, when you use MMF, uh, it's often associated with more side effects in children because they're, getting big, they, because they're getting bigger doses of this medication. So they frequently have more uh, leukopenia, anemia, and GI disturbances. By five years after transplant, uh, new antibodies directed against HLA antigen develop in 25% of children as compared with only 10% of that of adults. Uh, in consideration for the fact that you know, children are more likely to be tolerogenic, I think you know, the reason for this is because of uh, uh, poor, <coughs> poor adherence in the children population. And then, due to the use of potent immunosuppression since the mid-1990s, the incidence of EBV-driven PTLD and BKV has increased. But uh, there is a greater susceptibility to infection due to transmission from seropositive adults donor into seronegative uh, pediatric patients you know, with CMV 
or with EBV. Also, when they have this infection, such as CMV and EBV, uh, it tends to be more severe than what you have in the adult. And consequently, there is a higher graft loss and death rate as a result of these uh, infections. Uh, cytomegalovirus is the most common of this infection. It occurs in about 90% of pediatric kidney transplant recipients in the first three to six months. And in the absence of a prophylaxis, which is commonly practiced now, we do give a lot of these patients gansacrobial valcites you know, and the rest of them. Uh, preemptive, the prevalence of symptomatic CMV disease was about 10.5% in an APRITEC uh, database. epstein barr virus manifests as infectious mononucleosis, uh, which is uh, practically a, a benign disease. And um, you know, you may also have it manifesting as a PTLD. There is a spectrum of manifestation with PTLD uh, ranging from benign polyclonal lymphoproliferation. All you need to do is just to reduce the immunosuppression and this patient you know, may survive. To a malignant monoclonal disease you know, that may manifest as non-Hodgkin's lymphoma or even Hodgkin's lymphoma disease. So highly detection is very, very important you know, so, uh, for these viruses. And nowadays, uh, a lot of centers you know, will do PCR assay you know, in the first 12 months of kidney transplants uh, for EBV, CMV, you know, and sometimes for BKV. Uh, although the rate has declined in the last 30 years, acute rejection episodes tend to be more frequent in children. Uh, the small, and I've mentioned this before, I think the small size pediatric kidney transplants, um, given adult kidney size, you know, may show only small increase in creatinine despite acute rejection episodes leading to the delay in diagnosis. Uh, hospitalization in the first 24 months of transplant is now more frequently due to infection rather than acute rejection episodes, even though there is still higher rate of rejection episode in children uh, compared to that of the adults. But infection seems to um, be more prevalent you know, than uh, acute rejection episodes nowadays because of uh, uh, potent immunosuppression you know, that is being used. <laughs> Infection rate has also declined, <laughs> nevertheless, you know, from about 70% to around 30%. And of the infection, UTI is the most common, uh, you know, accounting for about 30% of pediatric kidney transplant uh, recipients. Uh, Pre-transplant nephroyuretectomy may be necessary for patients you know, who have uh, our urine volume reservoir you know, for instance, you know, uh, bilateral adrenophoresis or, uh, or very large bladder. Now, we do know that non adherence you know, is a big deal, you know, uh, with immunosuppression, which is most common in late adolescence. And we do have about six cases, you know, for, every, for 100 percent per year, accounting for about 10 to 50 percent of graft failure. Children are more susceptible to delayed graft function, you know, because of relatively low blood volume. Uh, and um, this is particularly the story when you, when you could have uh, vascular thrombosis in an extreme young donor, or if you use extreme young uh, kidney transplant, uh, uh, for extreme young you know, kidney transplant recipients. We need to screen for um, hypercoagulability, you know, such as, you know, protein C, S, anti T3 or factor 5 lady mutation. Uh, urinary leaks you know, due to ureteral necrosis, bladder injury, or urinary tract obstruction you know, could occur, especially when you use uh, younger donors. Uh, some efficacy of stents in reducing this complication is uncertain, and definitely some people think that you know, uh, the cost benefit you know, is actually quite low because of the high <coughs> risk of uh, infection especially when you use the stent you know, for more than 30 days. So nowadays, you know, stent is only reserved you know, for those who have high risk, who are at high risk of uh, bladder pressure. Lymphocyl occurs in about 1 to 10% of pediatric kidney transplant recipients, uh, usually more than that of the adults. Now, grad survival has improved you know, uh, for every successive cohort you know, from um, the 1990s you know, to uh, the present time. And, uh, and this is true for both living donor and deceased donor. 
In 2016, the annual report of OPTN, draft survivor was highest for living donors recipients younger than 11 years. And it is lowest for the dis dis disease donor recipients age 11 to 17 years, with 91% at five years draft survival for those less than 11 years, and 75% at five years for those 11 to 17 years. This is despite the fact that you know, there is higher rate of acute rejection episode in the youngest age group less than six years, you know, increasing from 9.3% in 2010 to 12% in 2015. Using the data from UNOS, uh, the graph failure was 58% higher among those transferred to adult-oriented care before 21 years versus transition after 21 years. I think, you know, transition has to be done diligently for adolescents to adult care, uh, you know, preferably by a dedicated team. And uh, it should be started early, you know, you should have early preparation. It should be customized, you know, according to the patient. And it should be, and it should definitely be gradual. Early mortality among um, kidney transplant recipients is very low. Uh, unlike um, in the adult population, uh, cardiovascular disease is not the predominant reason uh, for, for deaths. And deaths are mostly from infection or cancer. And, uh, and according to the NAPITEC you know, database for the cohort of 1988 to 2010, uh, periodic kidney transplant with PTLD, you know, they show patient survival of 87% um, at five years, compared to 48% you know, reported in the 1990s. So the age-adjusted all-cause mortality rates you know, decreased by 1%. And for cardiovascular mortality rates, also reduced by 16% for every year after the first year of kidney transplantation. But that of the infection, the infection-related mortality rates has not changed. And so as you can see here, um, for the living donor, uh, for the year 1987 to 1990, you know, the one-year graph survival is 89%. Um, for five-year graph survival, it is uh, 75%. By the time we get to 2003 to 2010, it was 97% and 84%, a remarkable improvement. For disease donor, it was 75% and 55% for one year and five years respectively. By 2003 to 2010, it was 95% and 78%. Um, growth concern, you know, um, is a major consideration you know, for children. And at one point, you know, children with end-stage kidney disease, they are approximately 2.5 standard deviation below the expected height for age. Uh, this has changed you know, tremendously. Uh, because of improved you know, pre-transplant nutrition and aggressive use of recombinant human growth hormone, uh, when human growth hormone was first introduced, uh, we thought that we could not use it you know, with kidney transplant because you know, the idea is that you know, the growth hormone receptor you know, is shared with cytokine receptor. So we thought that you know, there would be higher incidence of uh, uh, rejection. But it turned out not to be so. All right, so now uh, we're successfully using re recombinant human growth hormone. And uh, it's making a lot of difference you know, for children in terms of achieving, um, uh, uh, in terms of achieving reduction in height deficit. Steroid minimization strategy uh, have also contained high deficit in pediatric kidney transplant patients. Renal transplant improves um, longitudinal growth much more in prepubertal pre children compared to that of the adolescents. Uh, it is obvious you know, because, of the, uh, because of the difference in the, in the bone age you know, for the two populations. Um, clinical trials on steroid minimization strategy began in pediatric kidney transplantation. And there are many of such trials, you know, that's proven to be beneficial, uh, you know, that gave beneficial results. We have a late steroid withdrawal that uses you know, bacillusmab and tacrolimus and serolimus with or without you no know, steroids. And there was a significant better height velocity and, and graft survival 
but this study was stopped you know, due to excessive incidence of uh, PTLD. There was also safety of late steroid withdrawal, where they gave cyclosporine and MMF with or without the use of steroids. And in these studies, there was a significant better catch-up growth, there was less hypertension, there was less NODAT, and there was less uh, dyslipidemia in steroid withdrawal group. And in efficacy and safety of uh, steroid avodice trial, they used daclizumab five doses with uh, tacrolimus MMF and steroids, and daclizumab nine doses with tacrolimus MMF and no steroids. But there was a more height gain in younger children Com in this study, you know, compared to that of the older children. But it was a positive outcome result. So in summary, advances in technical, immunologic, and logistic issues previously confronting pediatric kidney transplant programs have led to remarkable improvements. You know, young children now have the best long-term grass survival among all age groups, including adults. Thank you. That was a, a real tour de force, I mean, a great overview. Um, two or three comments on um, um, nephrectomy. <coughs> I, I like to do the nephrectomy at the time of transplant, because you're inside, you take the two kidneys out, you create actually more space for the transplanted kidney. I mean, that's my personal preference. Yeah. I'm not sure how you think about it. But um, yeah, some people do one before, but then the kidney needs to undergo a particular small one. You can have two surgeries, so I, I'll just like to do it in one. Yeah, well, I think, you know, um, either way, I think, um, you know, if you can reduce the surgical mobility, you know, so by going, you know, um, doing it at one time, I think, you know, it should be preferable to that. The other thing the is you have to do your later, and then you have and so it how do I move to the thing with regards to stents, I would yeah. absolutely yeah. agree with you. I think yeah. children, particularly they get a dog, um, kidneys with dog the urine, yeah. there is no reason, I mean, to use the stents. The only time that I might use stents is when we yeah. um, accept yeah. on black kidneys, or really children, three, four months old, or adults. I mean, then I'm worried yeah. because yeah. The, 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 the urine is you know, so small. Yeah. Um, the other thing that we looked at, when you look at, at patient survival, this looks all great, I mean, looking at five years. But for a child, five years is nothing. You know, I mean, 50 years, 40 years, I mean, that's what we really have been looking at. And make no mistake, all the progress, one in six children uh, that receives a deceased donor or will not have a functioning kidney, one in six at five years. And, uh, um, um, uh, well, one, one in four, one in four will not make it to five years. And from the living donors, it will be only five out of six, so one will not make it. So there's so still a lot of room to make good. The last thing is, is steroid withdrawal. As much as I think steroid withdrawal has theoretically advanced, theoretical advantages, I think we now realize if we uh, withdraw steroids early, we will see more scarring, more fibrosis in the kidney. So with regards to children, I'm not quite sure what direction we are heading long term. So again, I'm, uh, I mean, I came from, um, from a center that was called the steroid capital of the world to, um, I mean, not giving steroids, and now I'm back to giving some steroids because I really think that, I mean, they still have their... I, I think, their you business. know, I think the problem is that, to me, for immunosuppression, what is going to make a lot of difference is customization. I don't think uh, all animals are created equal. I think you know we need to be able to select you know, patients you know, that will benefit from one pattern of immunosuppression, you know, compared to other patterns of immunosuppression. Yeah. So what, what I tend to do is if I consider patients immunologic risk, patients with rheumatoid uh, patients with uh, uh, SLE, you know, I'm more likely to maintain them on steroids. You know, but for those ones who are coming with the primary kidney disease, you know, being congenital anomalies, you know, um, uh, maybe Caucasians and stuff like that, you know, uh, immunogenicity is quite low, you know, I'm more likely maybe yeah. not to do yeah. And then as I said, uh, uh, yourself, Carrie, uh, Devin John, uh, Samarami, myself, we'll sit down with, uh, with the chief, with the 
chair of pediatric job yeah. folio. I mean, make pediatric transplantation a reality here. Mm -hmm. um, just uh, two quick things, um, because unfortunately I have another meeting session for 3.30. Um, I would like to thank Carrie for putting uh, this, uh, this together. I mean, this, uh, this is what it deserves. I mean, 300 people here. Because, uh, I mean, all the information that is given. So I think, I think it's really great that uh, Carrie that you did that. And I want to thank, or some have already left, but not all of them, the nursing staff that was here. I, I hope, I mean, we're not overwhelmed by all the information. <coughs> But, but you'll see, I mean, uh, I mean, a good number of things will stick. And you'll, you'll, you'll educate, I mean, other nurses on the floor. Because, I mean, ultimately, I mean, the better you are educated, the better it is. Because we, the physicians, uh, the coordinators, um, the, the social worker, everyone involved in transplantation, I mean, we, we know many of these things. I mean, this is our home turf. But what we have to make sure is that we have the best nurses here. And as I said, I was very proud to hear from Dr. Sai that the patients are coming back to us because they think we have, I mean, a very dedicated staff here, and that includes our nursing staff. So, so again, thank you very much um, for coming. It's not over, and I apologize <laughs> that I can't be here, I mean, for I mean, the, the two remaining talks yeah. right now. But um, um, I think this was excellent, and again, uh, thanks, Carl.